Hey everybody, uh, I'm Bailey. I graduated from George Tech with an environmental engineering degree as well as a minor in meteorology. I've been at the site now for just shy of three years. I started out in the Waste Disposal Authority and then taking advantage of the READY program, I rotated to DWPS for several months and then I ended up accepting a permanent position back in WDA. Our group does a lot of the PAs that you heard mentioned earlier and so we look out into the future to make sure everything we do today in this paint farm as well as salt stone remains safe well into the future, you know, after the mission is complete here. So today I'd like to introduce Dr. John Till. He graduated from the uh, U.S. Naval Academy and served in the U.S. Navy Nuclear Submarine Program before retiring as a Rear Admiral from the U.S. Uh, Naval Reserves. After his active duty, he got his master's from Colorado State University, as well as a PhD from George Tech, Go Jackets. Um, he formed the Risk Assessment Corporation, which uh, played a key role in our understanding of how radionuclei or radioactivity like enters into the environment and then how it affects humans. He also has been uh, responsible for a major historical dose reconstruction project at many DOE facilities across the, uh, across the state or country. <laughs> um, his team developed the first in-depth dosimetry from exposure to uh, the military personnel who participated in atmospheric testing of the nuclear weapon. He has uh, published over 200 different books and papers including his latest one right here, which is the Radiological Risk Assessment and Environmental Analysis. He is a distinguished member of the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement. He, in fact, chaired this uh, book right here. He's also served on the International Commission of Radiological Protection and has worked with the International Atomic Energy Agency on several reports. He lives today with his wife, Susan, on their family farm in South Carolina, and I'd like to welcome Dr. John Till. Great job, Bailey. Great job. She was very worried and nervous about that, guys, so I told her just keep it short, right? And she did a great job. I, I would hate to be the person to introduce me because my career has just been all over the place and people don't know exactly what to say, okay? I've been very lucky, very blessed with a, a great career. Um, it, it's terrific to be here with you guys today. Um, I didn't want to leave my farm hat on just for a few minutes until we get into the science because I got a couple of farm stories to tell you. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break out, I'm going to explain three completely different projects that my team has undertaken over the past 20 years or so, okay? Um, I think you'll find it interesting because really when you guys get out there and you're working for someone, you're gonna be solving problems. That's exactly what you're gonna do. And nobody's gonna tell you how to do it in most cases, right? And so I'm going to explain how we solve several problems and <clears throat> a little bit about the science itself of radiological assessment. Uh, first thing I wanted to do is let's see if this works now. It does. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, that's a submarine, Guardfish, SSN-612 that I served on back in the in the 1960s and 70s. It's a fast attack nuclear submarine, pretty famous actually, because it's the submarine uh, uh, um, that, that uh, has, has been used in uh, the hunt for Red October, if you remember that movie, if you ever saw it, the John Clancy book, right? That was a guardfish. It actually happened, okay? I was not on board. I had just left to go off to graduate school, so I can't tell you the true story, okay? But it actually happened. That was my submarine. But what I tell my friends about my submarine career, um, they're always saying, well, how did you do that? I mean, how do you go underwater for 60, 70 days at a time? How can you stand that? Cramped quarters, you know? Uh, the point is, it's not cramped at all. And if you look at the, the bottom, I bet you've never seen this before. 
This is the guardfish. This is the guardfish in overhaul. Have you ever seen what a submarine looked like when it was out of water? A huge part of that submarine is not visible. And it's actually quite roomy. Uh, back in those days, the submarines were much smaller than they are today. Um, the only thing you had to worry about on a nuclear submarine, you never run out of gas, right? You never run out of gas, but you do run out of food. And so before you leave, especially if you're headed out on a 60-day patrol, which I did several times, you have to put as much food on the submarine as you can, and you put it everywhere. And you put it on the deck, the floor of the submarine, all over the submarine, and when you leave to go on your patrol, you're walking on boxes of food, all right? And you just literally eat your way down to the floor, okay? So it's, it's a wonderful uh, um, part of our Navy, incredible camaraderie among submariners, uh, incredible training. And I'm going to tell you, everything I talk about today, I owe it to the Navy and my training in, in nuclear submarines. And so, um, all right. I'm going to start off by telling you a farm story. So Bailey mentioned this, but my career was not planned. It just happened, all right? And this is what's going to happen to every one of you guys. Things are going to happen to you that are going to shape your life forever. Um, I was born over here outside of Orangeburg, spent all my summers on the farm about a thousand acre farm. It was a big dairy farm. My uncles and grandfather ran the farm. And about the time I finished my PhD and um, was working up at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I had a fantastic job. It's a facility somewhat similar to Savannah River. These are incredible places to work. The farm fell apart. I had two uncles that died suddenly and my granddad was going to have to sell the farm. Now, here I am. I'm off to a great career as a scientist at Oak Ridge. But I couldn't bear to see the farm sold. And if any of you have a connection to the farm and you have it in your genes, you know what I'm talking about. But I couldn't bear to see it sold. This was 1977. So I discussed it with my wife, and we decided, okay, let's move to the farm. Everybody thought I was crazy, totally nuts. John, why are you doing this? You have a great career plan here at Oak Ridge. You're going to throw that all away, throw away your PhD. You're going to move to a dairy farm. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you one thing to remember. If you won't remember me long after this lecture, I know that. You won't remember what I say very long. But we had a superintendent at the Naval Academy when I was a plebe, and plebe year is really, really hard. And he kept telling us, he said, just remember one thing. He said, you can do anything you set your mind to do and don't forget it. And he used to get our whole our class together, and he would always say that of us after a talk, and we would join in. You can do anything you set your mind to do, and don't you forget it. So maybe that's one thing out of this lecture you'll remember. You don't have to remember me, but that's so true because I'm the living example of a person who has done that. I've had a great Navy career. I've had a great farming career, and, and I've had an incredible life as a scientist, okay? so. Uh, uh, this is what morning glory looks like. Uh, soon after I moved back to the farm, and let me ask you this, all right? How many of you have ever had one of those moments when somebody told you something, you saw something, whatever, but you knew you were in trouble? Huh? How many of you? Something, somebody said something, you knew you were in trouble, whether it was your parents or whatever. Maybe it's the tone of their voice. I'll tell you a little story. Not long after I was, I moved back to the farm, I was harvesting some, some corn with a combine. Okay, you know how we do that. Corn's dried down. 
This is morning glory, okay? And then this is what it looks like in corn. That's not a great picture, but there's your morning glory. It ha it's on a vine, and it grows about a foot a day here in South Carolina. And on a combine, you've got this header, and if you guys come out in my farm, which may be, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you this, okay? And it, it goes along and it yanks the stalk down and it pops the ear of corn off, that threshes the corn. But going through morning glory, all those vines just get caught around your header. It is the worst possible nightmare, worst possible plant you ever want to be contending in, in, in your life, okay? Especially as a farmer. So I'm very hot. I remember it was 100 degrees. I was right by the road, and this car stops, a white car stops, and a little old lady comes out. She had a yellow suit on and a white straw hat, and she's doing this to me. And I thought maybe she was in trouble. Pulled the combine over there by the, by the little old lady, and I kind of slowed it down so I could hear what she was saying. And she said, hey there, young man. Hey there, young man. I got a question for you. Yes, ma'am. What are those beautiful purple flowers there in your field? And I said, ma'am, they're not flowers. It's morning glory. It's a weed. She said, why do you grow so much of it? <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was in trouble. Okay, that's my morning glory story. Uh, let's get to work here. Uh, my team all over the country. I started this in 1977. We were virtual in 1977. Anybody on my team can live where they want to live in the country. They have to be motivated. They have to be smart. They have to have the skills to work alone. And these are some incredible people. Anything I talk about today, I give these guys credit for. Okay? So, they participated in this work that we'll be talking about. A little bit about the farm. Two of the uncles up the right, they, they died suddenly. My granddad, another uncle, uh, and I kind of took over the farm. And then when they passed away, I was originally a dairy farm, I sold the cows, and the farm looks kind of like what you see down on the right hand, bottom right hand slide. It's a paradise where I live. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I would not trade what I do, how I live, my friends on my team, or anything in the world. So risk assessment, that's what I do, okay? I got into this very early on in the 1970s. It was not a cohesive science, and that's how this all evolved. I got involved in, and put together a couple of books uh, early on. When I first started, uh, I was at Oak Ridge, and all the different parts of risk assessment were at different parts of the laboratory, different divisions of the laboratory. And it was very difficult when I needed a calculation of something released in the environment. I had to go over to the chem tech division, get that. If I wanted a, a, a computer program run, I had to go to computer science to get that done. I said, why can't we pull all this together? And that was the origin of the textbooks. And the, the black book there, I was very fortunate, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission agreed with me on this, and they supported that book to be put together. Um, it's not a great book, but it's got some great information in it, okay? And what it is, a risk assessment is understanding and communicating the movement of radionuclides and chemicals released in the environment, the resulting exposure to humans from the radiation, okay? and the subsequent dose or risk from exposure. That's what I do. Stuff gets in the environment, we figure out where it goes, we figure out what the radiation dose to you would be, or the risk of cancer, okay? That's what we do. Um, why do we need it? Well, we need it for compliance, emergency response, remediation, um, health impact, facility design. I mean, for a lot of reasons, we need this science. All right, and I hope that each one of you, while you're here, get involved in some part of risk assessment. All right, this is the only equation that you're going to see for the day. But if I had to put my profession into an equation, this is what it's all about. This is everything you need to know about risk assessment right here. 
All right, if you want to calculate a dose or a risk, you got to have figure out what your source is. That's the S, right? How much stuff gets into the environment? What's the chemical form, the temporal distribution? That's the source. And there are, there are some of you here at the Savannah River now, probably some of the guys back there, the senior people that do nothing but spend their time on the source, figuring out that quantity, right? Once it gets into the environment, where does it go? It's transported through air, surface water, groundwater, all right? And that's the specialty of Scott and his team is the groundwater, okay? And it gets transported through the environment. Once it goes through the environment, it exposes people. So we have to figure out what the exposure is. How much of it would be consumed through water, inhaled, from the atmosphere, whatever. And once we know that, then we can turn it into a dose, the D, because we've been working for 75 years to figure out where radionuclides get uh, once they are inhaled or ingested, where they go in the body and how they distribute to the various organs. If I know that, if I know that, then I can calculate the risk, okay? And we calculate uncertainty, we validate, we communicate this stuff, and in some cases, we even bring the public in and ask for their participation. That's all I do. That's it, right there in a nutshell. And that's what the books are about. Now let's take a look at a, a real case. And uh, this is the Los Alamos audit for Clean Air Act compliance. This is one of the craziest jobs I have ever been asked to do in my life. Uh, I was in my office one day and I got a phone call from the Department of Justice. And what on earth would Department of Justice be calling me for? So the lady said, uh, are you John Till? Yeah, I am. He, and she said, well, you've been recommended to carry out an audit on the Los Alamos National Laboratory for compliance with the Clean Air Act. I said, why? She said, well, this is a settlement agreement. The laboratory was sued by an environmental group and the attorneys and the two parties got together and agreed to pick an independent auditor and however the results came out from the auditor would be the answer. So Los Alamos was being sued because the environmental group claimed they weren't in compliance, all right? They have certain regulations. I'll talk a little bit about that. I said, who's going to pay me? They said, we're going to pay you. And I said, who's going to tell me what to do? They said, nobody. You are completely on your own. You have the authority to do anything you need to do to carry out the audit. In fact, we were told we could carry out up to four audits over four years, whatever it took to demonstrate compliance. Okay, fine, you know, sounds exciting to me. I hadn't done much work at Los Alamos at the time. Uh, it's been a pretty cool place to go. Um, it's out in New Mexico. Beautiful, beautiful area. Have any of you been to Los Alamos? Yeah, yeah I'm sure some of the older folks have. Beautiful uh, national lab. In fact, this is where the first nuclear weapon was made. And the Trinity shot, you remember that? This is where it was all put together. The Trinity shot was our first nuclear test. Okay, but I had never taken on a project like this at all. Some of the challenges, Okay, so this is a legal process that I have to follow. I got certain rules I have to follow. Los Alamos is the highest security national laboratory that we have in the country. There's more classified stuff, more sensitive, super sensitive classified information there than any other laboratory. And the question po posed was, did Los Alamos laboratory meet the requirements for compliance with 40 CF 6, 6, 6, 40 CFR 61 subpart H for the year 1966. They had, they had pinned it down to the time. Now, the, get this, 
get this. That's not so bad, right? So far, it's not so bad. But the stakeholder group who filed a complaint, the environmental group, they had the right to follow us around everywhere we went and to check everything that we did. Easy? No, but I'll tell you why. I'm not going to, I'll just mention a couple of people. This, this gentleman here, this gentleman here, were the two key activists who participated in filing the suit. Highest security national laboratory in the country. Neither one of them are a U.S. citizen. All right, they don't have a clearance, and I'm supposed to take them anywhere I need to go at Los Alamos, and this has really never been done before. Okay, but I have the authority to do it. The laboratory has to work with me. We had to go into areas that were very sensitive areas. In some cases, uh, um, machinery, uh, laboratory equipment had to be covered up because it was classified, all right? But they had the right to be there, so the laboratory fortunately cooperated with us. Um, tough stuff, guys. You don't want to get yourself in this position. I don't want to do it again either. The bottom line is we got through this, okay? We, we needed to look at the uh, inventory. Um, this is something that the lab had to report, uh, effluent monitoring and major release points. Environmental compliance sampling for non uh, non non point sources, um, and we had to make a dose calculation. These are some of the things that we had to go through to verify, right? Okay. Um, the citizens group, their key complaint was this: they said, "Look, Los Alamos is a complex terrain facility. Now, the government regulation used a model called Cap 88." Okay, it's what's called a flat terrain um, Gaussian plume model. Very, very simple, but they were making the, the case that CAP 88 did not fit Los Alamos, and therefore they weren't estimating the dose correctly. Make sense to you? Okay, good, yeah. So how are you gonna demonstrate this? Well, we've got, I've got some great modelers on my team, so we, we did a calculation this is CAP 88 here. Uh, this is a, a special terrain model called CALPA, okay, that takes into account uh, rough terrain, elevation, and so forth in the model. And so our idea was, let's see what kind of correlation we get. This is the bottom line, okay? So this is the correlation, um, a straight line. What straight line would have been perfect right here. This is the results. Okay, this is science. You're never going to get a perfect line, but that's very, very good. So what's that telling us? Well, it tells us that CAP 88 is pretty good, even in a complex terrain. Now, these guys, we had to give them all the data so they could run CAP 88, but their argument dissolved. Okay? Now, in the end, though, we had some problems, and Los Alamos had some problems. We issued a final report, um, but they, they did not have good documentation. They did not have good quality assurance, and there was no way for us to verify everything in their, in their report. So the bottom line of the first audit was they were out of compliance. Now, Los Alamos did not like us for this. They did not like us at all. I thought, I thought they were going to send out a hitman to get me whenever I left the lab that day. I was truly concerned because they were very, very angry. But look, we came back two more times. We did two more audits, and they were perfect. They were absolutely perfect. So we did them a service in the end, right? We changed the way they do business. We changed their QA. We changed their documentation. And in my view, have still to this day the model program for compliance. 
So all in all, it was a success. In the end, the environmental group, I thought they were going to shoot me, okay, because they didn't like our answer. But you got to remember, you're not, you don't make people happy with science. That's not what we do. We're here to find out what the truth is, okay? So let's go. Different study, okay? There's a facility up in southwestern uh, Ohio. It's no longer there, but it was called the... Uh, for all feed materials facility. It was a Department of Energy facility that processed uranium, okay? Now this all came up because a family named the Clausens filed a lawsuit against the Department of Energy who lived uh, uh, very close proximity to the facility and four people in the family had cancer and they think they thought at the time the cancer was caused by the facility. Now, for, um, for years, when I, when I was at the farm as a child, this place was always called the bomb plant. That's all I knew. I didn't know what went on here. It was all classified. It was called the bomb plant. And I knew it was classified. And that's the way Fernald was. There's, at the facility, there's a water tank that had uh, red and white checks on it, like a checkerboard, and people always thought it was a Purina dog processing, dog food processing plant, believe it or not, okay? But when they realized there was uranium being released, people began to get uh, concerned, right? So our job, and we were hired, we did this work for the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, our job was to go in and try to figure, excuse me, how, figure out how much uranium was released over what period of time and what was the risk, okay, over the entire operation of the facility. This is the facility, what it looks like. There's your uh, checkerboard uh, tower here, okay? Um, and this is this turns out in the end to be the real problem, and that's where some uh, enriched uranium ore was, was stored called K25 material. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so how do you do this? I mean, how do you go in uh, after uh, 40 years of operation of a facility, figure out how much uranium was released to air or to water, and calculate a dose to people live that, who live next by, okay? If you look at it close up, the plant's extremely complex. There were 120 different stacks where uranium was released. You have to take every single stack. You have to look at its history, look at the historical records, figure out what was going on, and you have to look at um, uh, the air cleaning equipment that's called a scrubber, and you know the efficiency of it, you know how much is going in, you know how much is coming out, okay? And then you look at the uh, material going out of the stacks, um, if you know all of this, and it's it's been us about it took us about four years to get to this point where we really knew how much was coming out of the, the stacks, okay? But you can do it. Okay, so in the end, this is what it looks like. If you had a curve of total release of uranium to the environment, this is what the curve looked like from 1951 to 1987. Up in the early years. Very significant amounts of uranium released to the environment. Very significant amounts, okay? Now, one thing one thing you didn't see in the equation, there was a little V at the end of it but that meant validation. So as scientists, we can make these calculations, and they're theoretical calculations based on data, and that's all good. But how can you prove that they're right? And that's what validation is about. And so let me tell you what we did here. The very unique analysis, okay? In the first place, we took releases to air, okay? So just take a look at this, this curve. This is our predicted release to air as a function downwind, an average, okay? 87, 88. 89 different years, and these were measurement data, actual measurement data. Is that 
good? That's really good. Okay, so that gave us a lot of confidence that the predictions we made to error were uh, pretty solid estimates, all right? I know that wasn't for all the years, but we didn't have data for all of the years, but this is a good piece of the puzzle. It makes us feel confident about what we did, okay? So what else did we do? Let me tell you about uranium, because you know what? And for those of you that are older who are in this room, of all the studies that I've done, and there have been uh, dozens and dozens of different studies, more trouble, uranium gives us more trouble than any other element, any other radionuclide. It, it's amazing how much trouble we've had with uranium, even though it's a pretty benign uh, carcinogen. But here's what uranium does. And it was released from the site. It could have been soluble. It could have been insoluble. But we knew how much was soluble. We knew how much was insoluble and then put into the air. If it's soluble, what happens to it in the environment? Well, it'll deposit on soil. It rains and it carries, gets carried into the ground, right? So it's not on the surface. But if it's inside, it's going to stay on the surface pretty much forever, okay? And so we have measurements of uranium around, whoops, around the plant. Um, We have measurements of uranium around the plant. So if you know how much has been deposited above background, you can run your model backwards and figure out what the source term was. That sounds kind of wild, doesn't it? But you can do it. This is the first time I think anybody's ever tried this. But let me show you something. Well, this is just... This is just the, uh, the breakdown. This is the model overall. You have, all you have to do is know the soluble amount and the insoluble amount. All right. <clears throat> so here's what we predicted with our calculations that would be released to air. The median value was 310,000 uh, kilograms. That's the median value with boundaries of uncertainty up to 360 or 270. So then we run the model backwards using what's in the uh, soil, and look what we get. 284,000 for a median with 720, pretty high uncertainty or down to 130. But, but this is science, okay? This is a scientist gave me a lot of confidence in what we did, okay? It's not perfect. But that's what science is all about. All right, so in the end, we found though we spent four years working on uranium. We never looked at the um, radium problem and radon being emitted from these, uh, these tanks. Radon comes from radium. Radon is pretty dangerous natural material. If, you, if it builds up in your basement, you know, you want to be concerned about that. It's carcinogenic. carcinogenic. And what we found out was that really the risk and Pernal came from these tanks and some people who just happened to live right over here on the other side. And so we had to go through and calculate what the risk was in the end. And let me just point out one number. This is the 50th percentile. This scenario is that family that lives fairly close to the tanks. Scenario number one. A 1.3% chance of getting cancer if they live there all their life. Is that important? Well, you probably don't know that yet, the answer to that question, but it could be. That's a fairly high risk, all right, to be exposed to. And you would want to, you would be a little bit upset if you found out you lived there all those years. However, the risk from all of the other scenarios was extremely low. So in the end, you know, this is what we, we had to report this. You got to be fair about it. And so when you put it in the paper, of course, study cancer risk higher near phenol, which is true. Okay, it was higher near phenol, but really 
not to the extent that all of the people who lived around Fernal um, <clears throat> uh, had a high risk of cancer. Nor, in my opinion, would those people on the front of Time magazine who live farther away, could their cancer have been responsible for that facility? The bottom line is, when we finished our study, Fernal went away. People no longer were concerned. The Department of Energy did clean it up. It was a, it's a beautiful story because it's a success story. Okay, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna take the last few minutes. I'm gonna talk about the atomic veterans. <clears throat> this is something I'm still working on. Um, and you may not know this, but this is an important bit of history. And for me, it's personal because I'm a Navy guy. And because I'm a Navy guy, I really had a deep understanding of calculating doses to these guys um, that other people might not have had. Up until 1963, beginning in 1945, we detonated um, 216 atmospheric tests. You guys wouldn't remember this, but a lot of people were outraged that we were even doing this, but the Cold War was going on. We had to test the weapons. It was the only way we really knew how to test the weapons. But we also wanted to know whether, how we wanted to know how our military would react if a nuclear weapon went off and there would orders was to move forward into the into the fallout from the test, right? We didn't know how military would react, and so we carried out a lot of tests. Um, there were 220,000 military veterans. They didn't volunteer, they were told to go. Most of them, in some cases, didn't know what they were going to do. So these guys in my book are heroes, okay? They really are heroes. So I had a chance. I was the first guy to be able to do this because the, the Department of Defense declassified the historical records that I needed to reconstruct doses to these individuals so we could determine do they have a higher incidence of cancer. So my team calculated doses for 114,000 plus military veterans. In some cases, these guys were marched directly into the fallout into ground zero within minutes after the weapon was set off. And I know this kind of blows your mind. I hope it blows your mind, okay? Because it's, uh, it's scary when I think about it. But we had methods that we used. We knew what the radiation field was. We had guys with monitors out there, but this is pretty crude stuff, remember? Check in to see what the radiation field was like as we marched these Guys, they were all men into the uh, into the radiation field. This is ground zero for the Trinity test. It, it always uh, fascinated. This is uh, out in New Mexico. Uh, this is William Lawrence back here. That's uh, Oppenheimer, father of uh, nuclear weapons. This is General Groves right here. But anyway, these these guys, these are all in our study. These guys are all in our study to see if they had a higher incidence of cancer. Sixty percent of them were Navy. And what we did, this is um, one one of the earlier. This is Castle, one of the earlier shots out in the Pacific. And these ships are not manned. Uh, we took the crews off, but we wanted to see what the damage would be to the ships if they were close into a nuclear blast. And in some cases, the ships are totally destroyed and sunk. In some cases, the ships just got damaged 
and there's contamination on them. And right after the tests, <clears throat> we'd send out a, board, a boarding party with some instrumentation to go back onto the ship to just to see what the radiation fields were like, to look at the damage. Now, you, can you imagine this? This is right after the shot. They're doing this, okay? We're sending them out to check all this, okay? So as a scientist, I've got to figure out if I know the guy and I know what his rate and his rating was, okay? A rate in the Navy means your rank. That means your pay grade. A rating means a skill that you have. So if I know their rate, I know their rating, I know that I know where where they would be aboard ship. I know what they would be doing. All right. So this is our insignia in the Navy. Um, you know, we have electricians mates, machinists mates, engine men, boiler tenders, bosun's mates. These are the guys that tie up the ship. There's some of you guys may know about this. This is a third class, second class, a first class sailor. So this this information was absolutely key to reconstructing a dose. Absolutely key. And so <clears throat> someone like a, a boiler tender, who I have a rating of a boiler tender, this is a destroyer, for example. Now, one other thing I didn't mention is after the blast, we took our ships back into the lagoons and the lagoons are highly contaminated. Now, you got to remember ships take in seawater to cool the condenser, goes through the engine room and then it goes back out after it's cooled the condenser. And so one area aboard ship I would be concerned about is the engine room, which is right here, and this is where your um, turbines are, and that's where your seawater is taken in. And if your duty is in the engine room, they did have some measurements of radiation exposure in the engine room, then I could tell you about what the dose is, because I know how long they spend there if they're on watch, right? This is the boiler room. The boiler room doesn't take in steam water, I mean seawater. And therefore, if you were in the boiler room, you probably didn't get as much exposure, okay? So these are just the keys. And just so you know, being a Navy guy, this really helped me a lot, um, understanding what the doses might be. It's just an example of a declassified document from the Department of Energy that gave us really important clues. Okay, and I, everything is um, blacked out here. That's private information, so you won't you won't see any names, nor did did I. But uh, um, the point is, this is for the USS Katrin, APA seventy one. Okay, they're more, this is a specific day, Thursday in August of, I forgot what year it is. And it says, okay, at 0730 in the morning, a boarding party assisting our Lieutenant so-and-so and these individuals, okay, left the Catron um, and they went until 1130 that morning. They went over to the ship what does that tell me that's key? It's giving me the names of the people who went, number one, and number two is telling me what time they left and what time they came back. So I know how much exposure they received when they boarded that ship. So these are, this is the way we reconstruct doses to individuals. Now, I'm gonna, uh, I know this is a lot of numbers and I don't want you to worry about <clears throat> this too much. And you probably don't know much about dosimetry, okay? But these are the estimated doses. These are mean doses to um, different branches of the Navy that we studied in the nuclear, at the nuclear test station in Nevada and out in the Pacific proving grounds. And uh, this is in milligray, 
And Millie Gray, what that is, it's, it's the dose to the bone marrow, because that's what we were looking for first, the bone marrow, okay? The most sensitive cancer we have caused by radiation is uh, leukemia. If you're interested in leukemia, you're interested in the bone marrow and what the dose would have been. If I know the dose, then I can calculate a risk. But if you just take a quick look at these, these are actually low doses. These are, this is 600 uh, milli, milli, uh, milli rad, basically. Um, would have been, if you want to rim, you know, this would be about uh, 1.1 1. 1 rim. Okay, so the doses are really quite low. So what did we see? We just released this uh, last year at the end of 2021. John Boyce is an epidemiologist. He took our dosimetry data. They have all of the atomic veterans. They know who got cancer, what kind of cancer, did they die of cancer. Um, they know everything about the individuals. If you know how many people died, and if you know those individuals' dose, then we can do a calculation to determine, is there a dose response? The bottom line of this is the atomic veterans did not have a higher incidence of cancer. And I, I was shocked. And so were a lot of other people. But when you look at the doses, you're not too surprised, right? Because these are doses that are around the levels of limits that we use right now. But this is a huge data point in our bulk of uh, knowledge about radiation exposure. This is probably the most you know, important piece of work I ever did, and I'm still working on it. Okay. Um, no, no higher incidence of disease, right? Very uh, remarkable find. That's basically what I just told you. Don't worry about the numbers, but that's the bottom line of the estimated relative risk. And, uh, it's, it's all pretty benign. We look for uh, leukemia, um, multiple myeloma, lung cancer, male breast cancer, prostate cancer, genetic heart uh, disease, and there's no correlation with their exposure. This is the, this is the front end of the science right now. This is the top of the curve of where we are and what we understand. And, and this is just a part of a very, very important piece of work that's going on. And I'll just wind up with telling you about this. It's called the Million Person Study. Now, 114,000 veterans, that's a lot of uh, individuals, a lot of individual doses, good data, really good dosimetry. Um, but if we really want to understand what's going on at this low dose level, which is what I'm I showed you those doses, right? Because people are still criticizing us about this. They believe, a lot of people believe that, uh, that there is a risk from cancer no matter how low the dose is, okay? And to tell you the truth, we assume this but the truth is, we don't know. The only way we're going to find out is to keep studying. And the only epidemiology that will solve this problem is if you get a large enough population so that you can, statistically, you can detect an effect at a low, a low dose. And that magic number is about 1 million people. And that's called the Million Person Study. It's going on right now. We're a part of this. Uh, it's being undertaken. It was conceived by uh, Dr. John Boyce, um, uh, who's the director of the study. And I won't go through all of these, but if you were to add up the numbers in this column, you get a million people. These are different cohorts of people who were exposed and were calculating doses to all million of them, 
high quality dosimetry. And in the end, we're going to pool these different studies and it's going to tell us something. It's going to tell us are there effects at low doses or not. I hope I live to see this. Um, it's, it's really going to take about another 15 years unless unless we're trying right now to get special money from a foundation to finish the study in five years. And I'm working on that with John Boyce. And um, if we can, uh, we'll have an answer for you in five years. Million person study. Last Friday, a huge report, a report of huge importance was published by the National Academy of Sciences. And they put together a special group to look at low dose radiation and to make a recommendation to Congress about what we do. Number one, here's what the, the answer was. Now I can't, I can't read this, so let's see. I'll just summarize it for you. The U.S. should establish a coordinated research program to investigate the impacts of low doses of radiation on human health. The committee estimates that it is um, it'll require um, up to a hundred million dollars annually for 15 years to complete all the work that needs to be done to do this. And those are cellular studies, epidemiological studies. Um, but it said this is the most important thing in Congress we could fund that would help us understand low dose radiation. And that's the story, guys. That's the story. A little bit, a little bit over my time, but um, I just want to tell you um, a couple of things to wrap up. Um, when, when you look at a profession, and if, if, as I look at my profession right now, uh, one of the things I don't want you to think is here is John Till. He's been doing this 50 years and all the good work has been done. It is exactly the other way around. It's like looking through a funnel that's turned upside down, all right? The more you look, the more that we need to do. So this is so exciting to me to see you guys so young, just coming into a profession and you haven't pinned all that down yet, okay? But you're just coming in. I wish I could be you right now and start over with what I know right now, okay? It would be so cool. So you're getting into a profession that's absolutely wide open and exciting and there's so much more that we have to learn. And then I'll tell you one other thing um, about modeling, because that's what we do, mathematical modeling. That's what my team does. We have a problem with people using models who really don't know what's in the model. Uh, my advice to you, if somebody says, here's CAP 88, you know, go, go run it and tell me whether or not we're exceeding the, the dose limit. If you don't know what's in the model, you need to learn, okay? And a lot of people who can run sophisticated performance assessment models, whatever, okay, uh, don't really know what's in the model. And that's a downside and something to be wary of. This has been wonderful talking to you guys. I, I really look forward. I think we've got a date now for coming out to the farm. If you could come, that, that'll be another experience. I won't bore you with the science, but I'll tell you a lot about farming and we'll have a wonderful, wonderful time. Okay, Scott. John, go back to your slide to the Pernal A65 silo residues. Okay, which one? The Pernal. How many history buffs do we have in here? Any? So so?
That's right there. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if on the top left hand side. Yeah. That's what John was talking about. Those were uranium ores. At one time, that was the largest source term in the world of radon. Yes, that's my understanding. K65. K65. And the origins of that, though, was the Belgian Congo. Yep. And so the Belgian Congo during World War II, there was a letter that um, Einstein wrote to Franklin Delano Roosevelt warning him about the hazards of this uranium that could be used to be making nuclear weapons. And this was 1939. I have a copy of the letter. Again, Scott, it's not the original, but it, there's a history of it because it went from the Belgian Congo. I think Leslie Gross discovered that it was at Staten Island. Yeah. It was in a warehouse that the gentleman who had ran the Belgian Congo mines had shipped it to the United States. There's tons of it. And so that became the source term of the, the uranium that was enriched in, in Oak Bridge and that was used to make the first nuclear weapon that was detonated on That's the right. parachute. Yeah. And it stayed there until the 1990s, um, and then it was packaged up and it was disposed out in West Texas. It's got a really unique kind of history of it, but I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. So, so John, I, your, your presentation is outstanding. As always, I've not seen this one yet. Well, thank you. So did you guys have questions? Go ahead. You mentioned the couple times where, like, you publish the paper and then reporters would take it and kind of struggle with it and write headlines. Um, did you ever make any efforts to communicate with reporters, news stations, or did you just publish your paper and then they did what they wanted to do with it? A bit tricky, okay. Uh, you guys didn't hear the last lecture I was, I gave. Uh, and I was here about a month ago and I talked to some of the staff about uh, the Hanford study and something I learned from the Hanford study, it was a it was a study that changed me as a scientist. And I can't I don't have time to go through all of that. But at Hanford, they released about eight hundred thousand cures of item one thirty one and it was kept secret for almost fifty years. When the public found out about it, they were furious and they demanded an answer, right? I was asked to go in and lead the study to report to the Department of Energy, to, to report to the public what happened, okay? When you do something like this, one thing you learn is you can't take the time to go through the publication process because it can take up to a year to publish a paper, right? Okay, and and we didn't have that luxury. It was the same situation in Phnom. People wanted answers. Okay, we made it very clear when we talked to the press, when we talked to the public, that our answers were preliminary answers. And we have published the Phnom work subsequent. Okay, um, so. There are situations, and this is a really important point. You you don't you're not allowed to follow the complete scientific process. You've got to take your best shot at it, do the best work you can do, and you have to talk to the public about it. But you always qualify that the answer may change. Does that answer your question or not? Yeah. John, what I would elaborate on, that's what you should see throughout this lecture series. And it's the importance of stakeholder engagement, communicating with um, your communities. They need to understand the risk that our facilities pose. They need to understand the work that we do. It needs to be transparent. And I think you'll see that thread throughout each of the different lectures for this summer. And I hope you keep asking those kind of questions. What other questions do you guys have? Yes, ma'am. I'm I'm hard of hearing, and I forgot my hearing aids today. So you, you got you got to talk loud. What inspired you to do all of this? What inspired you to do this? Which project? No. What 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 work inspired you? What in your life inspired you to do this? Is that right? Yeah. Um, Hanford changed me as a scientist, and like I said, I don't have time to talk about that today. But uh, when when you're confronted with a scientific study in an environment where the public are already just angry at you 
don't believe anything that you say. You've got to think quick. And I had to think quick. Okay, and fortunately, I had the guts to make some decisions in Hanford that had never been made before. I declared it an open study. I told the public they could come and watch what, watch me work if they wanted to. Okay, I went to the Department of Energy and I said, I've got to have this information declassified because as a scientist, I cannot use classified information. And they did it. Okay, we were being paid by the Department of Energy to study the Department of Energy. That's a conflict of interest. And so I worked with Senator John Glenn, uh, and he helped me get the study transferred to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Huge, huge changes. And I could go down a list of what we did in that study. Um, it, it not only it's it it, it, it not only it inspired me, but it taught me as a scientist what the limits are. You know, uh, I can't always just go in my office and do my calculation and send my publication off. There are times when I can't do that, and it changed me. I will tell you right now. I believe that releases to the environment by DOE facilities uh, ought to be public right away. I know, I know they're eventually made public, but I actually set up a system at Los Alamos where the regulator could uh, sign on and look at uh, environmental releases and the public could sign on. I mean, what's wrong with this? And we still haven't come to that point in this country OK, um, we still haven't come to that point and we don't have anything to hide. And, and that's my point. So all of this has inspired me. I love my science. I'm going to keep working. I'm almost 78 years old, guys. I'm the oldest person in this room by far. But I love this work. And there's so much that we still need to change. OK, so I'm inspired. I hope you get inspired by listening to me say these things. OK. That's a good question. You know, John, the work that you did for the Hanford Downwinder studies, that was just remarkable work. Um, I know you've been one of my friends at Nenforce for many years. That work really shaped my career, too. Yeah, I'm just, just, I remember when I first started out, those studies were just coming out. And so on all of these presentations, you know, we record them like we are now. We put them on a YouTube channel. So if you're interested in hearing about the work that John's talking about, the Hanford Downwinder studies, there's a presentation that was recorded. And it's uh, placed on a YouTube channel, so you can all see that. What other questions do we have? Go ahead. So you mentioned that the police should always work so the slaves were in the winter. Yep. How difficult is that for a group or lots of people to like that? You, you know, it, it, it was not as difficult as you think. All right, this is 77. All right, but believe it or not, Microcomputers are coming, fax machines are coming, FedEx, FedEx is about that time. By 1980, I was sending files to my colleague up in Oak Ridge over the phone, you know. I just got a receiver, you put your phone in a receiver, and I could send him a, a spreadsheet, okay? It wasn't as difficult as you thought. We had to do everything by phone, you know, there was no uh, internet or anything like that. Um, uh, so, so, but, but remember this, you know, in 1980, I didn't know what was coming in 1985. You know, I didn't know Apple was on the way, okay? And uh, so you just have to take what you've got and work with it. It was, a, I'll tell you why I love my people. Uh, and I hired somebody one time, and, and they were so excited about working for me, and they said, John, I, I, I don't know how to figure out where to live. That's the hardest decision they had to make, okay? And I said, anywhere, okay? So she moved to Washington, D.C. And, uh, but it, it's, a great, it's a great way to work, all right? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say one more thing. We're gonna, are there more questions or? Sorry. One for the audience from like, uh, the outside. Yeah, yes. same. And what is it? All right, so uh, this gentleman's asking, uh, 
My father was in the U.S. Army who participated for a reserve, the nuclear blast at India between 1956 and 1961, so an actual mm -hmm. observer. Is there a way to find what test he observed and what his acquired dose might have been? Yes, uh, the, the way to do that would be to write the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, in Washington, D.C., and they could look, look up his record and they could tell him, okay? DITRA is called Defense Threat Reduction Agency. It's a part of the Department of Defense, okay? Keep there any other questions from the audience, please? Yes, we do have one. Um, it says here in your risk assessment evaluation, how did you differentiate between prostate prostate cancer caused by radiation from those happening naturally due to age? Okay. Um, well, to tell you the truth, uh, um, we don't see an association between prostate cancer and radiation. We didn't see it in our study on, on the atomic veterans. Okay. Um, but overall, in all of the studies, and I'm not a radioepidemiologist, I'm just trying to recall what I know, um, but we don't see an association between prostate cancer and radiation exposure. And there are other organs in the body as well where we don't see an association, all right? So this is what we still need to study better, okay? So, so the prostate cancer that we saw would have been naturally occurring for whatever reason, not caused by radiation. Okay. John, you might not be a radiation epidemiologist, but John Boyce is probably the world's foremost authority. He also gave a presentation to our lecture series, I think it was last year, and we also have that recorded, so you should check out his uh, presentation as well. Yeah. Is there anything else on online? Uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. that was Okay, before you go, what did I say? Say it with me. You can do anything you set your mind to do and don't you forget it. I'm the living example of that. Thank you all very much.